Uh, thanks very much. It's a privilege uh, to be here, all the more so in that uh, Jean-Claude is here from the Commission, uh, but very few other funders, one of my colleagues from the, the UK, uh, Geraldine, is present. This is mostly the industry uh, who I suspect warmed to Michael's talk, uh, and our representative, representatives of uh, consumers, librarians notably, and others who I suspect may have warmed to Martin's talk. And I'm going to just pass a few comments about those before moving on to the UK. I'm talking not about what will happen in the UK, because what will happen in the end will be uh, um, a matter for the consumers and the industry to work together, uh, but certainly supervised uh, by the funders and the government uh, uh, who I will represent and indeed uh, do represent. Uh, they weren't talking to each other, they were talking past each other would be my summary of the first uh, two talks. Michael, you gave a great presentation of the value that the industry see in what they offer, and, and I, I accept a lot of it, but I think you have to accept that consumers do not always see it that way, and at some point, some attempt to understand better the way they do see it, in my view, is necessary if we are to move uh, move on. Uh, Martin, you presented a, a great view of how consumers see the uh, things should be taken forward. I had a lot of sympathy with that. I was a consumer uh, myself at uh, one time. Uh, I think the assertion so that we can move forward without the industry is a challenging one, and uh, we are a long way from common ground. I do note, just to pass comment on the two, that uh, when new things happen, very often they do arise out of the public sector and they are run out of the public sector. And in placing this discussion firmly within the changes that are happening in science, I'm very grateful uh, to Sabine for just uh, reminding us both that there are bigger worlds in which we play and we need to take account of the changes that are happening to science. In a period of change, the public sector often does lead. But in the end, in a mature system, professionals and private uh, industry generally offer better services. That's the way of the capitalist world. So I think my summary of the two talks, uh, we do, in my view, have no choice but to, in Martin's words, take a turn. I think we do have to change. I think the industry accepts that, although it's not for me uh, to say that on their behalf. The question is whether we take a turn led by the industry or whether we have to go in for what our colleagues in UK, US business schools call completely disruptive innovation. In the UK, in setting up Finch, we were going for a partnership between the industry and consumers uh, to move things forward. And I'm not quite sure how I moved to the next slide. So, sorry, if someone could just tell me. Ah, here it is, sorry. Uh, we, I, actually, I, with a colleague in the Research Council, set up the Finch uh, Group in 2012. Uh, Dame Janet Finch worked for me as uh, one of our uh, chairs of our uh, uh, panels for the Research Excellence Framework, and indeed she's on my Research England uh, Council now. Uh, that was the result of a determination uh, expressed very eloquently uh, by Martin that we should move forward into a world of open access, and a decision taken, in fact, behind the scenes, although the, uh, the uh, Finch Group did come to this position, that we should concentrate on the concept of open access and try and leave price mechanisms to take account of themselves. And I think I would summarize Martin's talk as saying impatience that there's no willingness to address price considerations alongside uh, the issue of uh, the principle of open access. Our government had a commitment to open access. I would like to say who doesn't have a commitment to open access. Now there are some, I've got to say. Uh, and just as Martin said, you believe in gold, uh, we expressed it slightly uh, more, uh, in a slightly more nuanced fashion. We had a preference for gold and uh, essentially established an immediate uh, gold policy from our research councils, which gave immediate 
problems with cost and to uh, provide a space for those problems with cost to be addressed, uh, we had a complementary uh, green policy, which in fact uh, was my own development uh, because of the way we work it, it, it worked for us. Uh, but in both cases, really, the objective was indeed, as Martin said, the flipping of journals uh, to gold open access and uh, to be done, as I said, in partnership. Uh, the report was quite strongly criticised, including by our parliament, which is uh, slightly uh, embarrassing, but nevertheless, the government stuck by the views and we moved uh, forward in that environment. Well, how has it gone? Should we have embarked in the UK uh, five or six years ago for the kind of confrontation which in Germany is viewed as the only way forward? Quite possibly, uh, uh, not for me to comment, because other avenues have already uh, been explored. I'm going to take some slides from two talks, uh, or one talk and a report, uh, that have been given in the last two months, uh, which present very different views of the same data. Uh, the first is Danny Kingsley from uh, University of Cambridge Library. Uh, Danny uh, worked in Australia where she was very respected in the open access environment, which Colin Steele uh, has led on, has moved to the UK, and I respect her views tremendously. If she says, as you will see, she does not think it has worked, we have to pay attention uh, to that. I will then give a, a slightly alternative view. Uh, and I, I'm now cherry-picking talks from a presentation, the details of which are there. There's a lot in her presentation about cost, which mostly I'm not going to talk about, because I remain of the view that we should concentrate on the principle uh, and uh, we should hope that uh, there will be mechanisms to address cost. Uh, that may be, I've got to say, unduly optimistic. Uh, and she points out that having implemented this preference goal for gold for six years uh, with considerable underwriting from government, uh, from people in what is my uh, new organisation, UK Research Innovation, our research councils, uh, we have succeeded in increasing the uptake of gold open access, uh, but principally through use of the hybrid mechanism uh, where a fee is paid in addition uh, to the subscription P fee uh, being paid for the journal. This was sensitive when I talked here four years ago. My advice then was that if we didn't find a way of across the industry introducing offsetting arrangements, hybrid would turn out to be the rock on which golden, gold open access foundered. Uh, thus far, I have been proved right. The biggest objection in the UK to, from uh, the consumers to moving forward is uh, the uh, perception, as they would have it, that they are paying twice the same product. And I have listened at length and repeatedly to the industry explaining to me how they're offering two different services. I accept that logically and rationally they may be right. In perception, they are wrong. And uh, my observation now, as working with government closely for many years, is that if you make a logical case for many years and on strong grounds, and it's consistently rejected, then you have to consider that perhaps perception is more important than your view of reality, and you have to pay attention to that and change. Uh, that is very sharp for us at the moment in the funding of our whole higher education system. Whereas OECD say we have the most sustainable HE funding system in the world, but our consumers uh, do not consider that it's an entirely acceptable system, and uh, in consequence, we have to look at amending it, no matter how much it is the right system. I would say the same about hybrid. If you want to persist with those arguments, we will not make progress. Uh, and uh, I think uh, some other comments that I'm not going to dwell on the particular uh, detail that Danny raises because it is a, a persuasive set of information that things are not going as well as she should. At Cambridge, 80% of their gold spend is on hybrid uh, publications. There are, of course, offsetting arrangements from uh, some. Uh, more critically, she says, the flipping plan has failed. 
Uh, so in consequence, if you believe this view of the world, then what our colleagues in Germany want to achieve, we have failed to do by our partnership arrangements. If that is true, it is a damning statement. Uh, and she also points out that the industry has responded in a way that our parliament predicted uh, the complementary green embargo has led, uh, green um, policy has led to an increase in embargo periods, actually creation of embargo periods where none existed. And although I'm not going to dwell on the details on this slide, I just want to show you that she has uh, fairly detailed information to back up her view. Uh, her consequence of the UK policy is that. Now, this is important to me uh, because we are committed to reviewing the UK uh, policy uh, in setting up the, the uh, Research Council funding uh, for gold open access fees. We time limited it uh, and agreed that we would review it before continuing. Uh, we are about to review it. Uh, however, we are committed to two further years of uh, paying uh, for gold open access fees. So, in fact, uh, there is time for us to review it and for us to come to some sort of agreement if the parties are willing. Uh, but fail is one summary. However, we also have, uh, and that is Danny as a professional, a consumer uh, pointing, we also have uh, a successor to Finch uh, group which has been monitoring, uh, led by Professor Adam Tickell from Sussex University, uh, a former colleague of mine, uh, who is, uh, reporting to the government uh, on what has been achieved uh, so that the government's in position uh, to uh, ask us to, to take things forward. Uh, there's a report published in uh, 2017 on the University's UK website, and I'm sorry, you want me to read this text. I, I just put it up so that I could uh, quote some of it from you. It's right that we are undergoing a transition towards open access, yes, uh, as this report shows, we are increasing the proportion of our research which is available by open access at a considerable rate. I think Danny, the statistics are the same as Danny's. She would disagree with the adjectives. Uh, we now make 37% of our outputs freely available to the world. Immediately publication, this increases to 53% after 24 months. Uh, the judgment which we will make at some point is whether that is satisfactory progress. Uh, you can say that it's not, or it is, I think, depending on your point of view. Uh, the UK, well above global averages of open access publishing, but perhaps our aspiration was to flip, not just to be a bit above average, uh, fundamentally changing the way that uh, research is conceived, disseminated, and rewarded. I think that's a challenging uh, a statement one might challenge. Uh, and then I think the, the, the penultimate paragraph uh, is the key one. Through a collaborative and constructive approach to aligning efforts, we have all contributed to advancing open access. And it is clear that such engagement will continue to be important to ensure that the transition to open access is maintained, is financially sustainable, and the benefits of research to society are maximized. If you agree with that, then we continue. If you take the view that we failed under more confrontational or uh, strongly negotiated position, as colleagues in this country are doing, uh, is required to uh, take a turn, as Martin said, then uh, perhaps we should revise our position. We have no view centrally in UK research and innovation about this. The government has no view. We are gathering the evidence, and both of the things I've quoted have come from the last two months. You are getting a timely view of what is happening in the UK. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell, the next couple of slides just show that I have, uh, there are statistics, there is well presented uh, work in the university's UK, uh, which uh, agrees actually on the numbers with Danny. It's all about perception and your, uh, your judgment on the success of what we have. ABCs remain higher for hybrids than fully open access journals. Uh, and for both kinds of journals, they've continued to rise. So the warning messages are in the University's UK report, even although the overarching message is more popular. The proportion of journals that offer intermediate immediate OA is rising. That is not quite what our aspiration was, or, uh, judging from what Martin says, his is, and move uh, to gold open access. Uh, I know, 
Danny's summary was how do we get out of this mess? Uh, I, I think that's as pejorative a way of putting it as both Michael and Martin managed in their own uh, ways, looking at things entirely from their own points of view. Uh, she thinks the way to get out of it is that our new overarching funder, which is, is our organisation, will take it forward. We are indeed the seven research councils uh, on that left-hand grey circle, uh, together with uh, my own organisation, which just to complicate matters is England only, whereas the others are UK, and our innovation agency, which is also uh, England only. And we'll be working with our counterparts with the other three blobs uh, in the devolved bodies because we have some difficulties with federal arrangements in the UK as well as in certain broader federal arrangements that I'm not allowed uh, to talk about. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, we're going to take this forward, working obviously uh, with the, the government. Uh, what we can say very clearly is, is actually what was said in my introduction, what Sabine said. It's, a, it's obviously a strategically important policy area to the organisation. It helps to get all of the bodies together in the room, and you can assume that we're working closely with the other players, such as Welcome, which of course is now both a publisher as well as a funder which I think complicates life uh, considerably. We are working within a strong position in open research, which Sabine has just uh, talked about. Uh, we need to take account of the points of view of those who are there to advise us, the Universities UK, obviously the government is there, because uh, uh, they are ultimately our, our bosses. Uh, one of our aims in typical arrogant UK fashion is that we want to take a leadership position internationally. In fact, I. I think I would argue that the move that we made with Finch was an attempt to do that. Uh, the key question is, did it fail or did it not fail? And are others now, uh, uh, clearly in this country particularly, taking a leading position internationally? Uh, we also have to harmonise some of our policies at a level of detail. And as I said, we'll take forward the Research Council's review in a UKRI context shortly. Uh, just a word about the economics of it because I'm uncomfortable myself with comments about grotesque uh, profit margins. I understand that is a valid consumer position, uh, but I can equally understand uh, the needs for uh, reinvestment, the need for funding innovation and so on, which I suspect Michael would, um, would be using and which he's previously talked with, uh, with me about. Uh, I'd like to point out, if we are going to do an economic analysis, which would be our uh, wish, we want to look at the functioning of our market. And uh, there are similarities with the higher education funding market, which is not an ordinary market in any sense, at least in the way it functions in the UK. Uh, we'd note that uh, the players, the academics, uh, they decide where to publish and no one is challenging that view of the world in the UK. But of course, uh, they're not in any way driven by cost because they're not paying. They are driven by a perception of value. Uh, they will publish where they think the highest value accrues uh, to them, actually, which is, is fair enough. Uh, universities are paying, mostly, I, I realise that this is, this, you, I'm generalising, uh, but they are mostly paying either for the APCs or for the subscriptions. They have an economic lever, but they have no, essentially no control over where materials uh, are published. Uh, funders subsidise, which is what we are doing uh, in our research council's APCs, but in the long term, it cannot be right in a market, uh, well, it's not obviously right in a market for me that public subsidies should play uh, a part, uh, and indeed uh, we uh, have already been through that cycle in the UK where we subsidised a big deal for only a couple of years actually, but then it proved resilient in the marketplace, uh, although perhaps an obstacle to further uh, further change, but we can hypothecate funds to subsidise. Uh, we can also regulate, and that is a major uh, tool that we have. Uh, regulation is a well-developed concept, uh, I guess, in other countries, certainly in the UK, something of great interest to us as we are engaging regulation in our higher education market much more strongly, and therefore much more aware of the principles that you'd apply to regulation in a scholarly publishing 
uh, market, and of course the publishers who are offering the services. Uh, I'd comment that there, there is no direct economic lever, so there's market failure in the way that we've designed it. If we gave all our money to academics uh, in small chunks and they took the decisions at where to publish, we would have uh, the, uh, a functioning market. We don't. Uh, the value is a perceived value, uh, which, uh, and in any market where there's a perceived value, you open up uh, price gouging or rent-seeking opportunities. Technical economic term, not intended to be a pejorative term uh, like grotesque profits. Just the fact that you cannot tie the price in any way to the cost or to some objectively assessed position uh, assessment of value. Uh, exactly what's happening in higher education at the moment, uh, where uh, there are the possibilities for universities to charge higher fees than could be justified, uh, that a comment in quotes, because we don't know how to justify it, because we've got no objective measure uh, or no absolutely agreed objective measure of the value that universities deliver, so you can't decide whether their uh, cost, whether, it, whether their price, where it is very different from the cost, is justified and where it is price gouging or rent seekings a better model. Uh, is a market even possible in scholarly publishing, I think is a question. Uh, the one thing I would say is uh, to tie together Martin and Michael's comments that if the perception is that the, by the consumer that the price is unreasonable, then there is always a problem. And typically, some kind of change happens in the marketplace as consumers uh, choose to exercise their market power. More difficult because uh, the consumers are the academics and the funders, the, the people who pay are the universities. But I think uh, to bat away the comment about um, grotesque prices without trying in some way to tie it better to the value. And I accept the ways in which Michael tried to capture value, but I don't think it'll wash with the consumers. It won't do with consumers, so we have a problem. So we need some element of disruption. Uh, in Germany, they're doing it uh, in confrontational style, and uh, we're certainly very interested to see how that goes. Uh, we're doing, uh, I think, two things in the UK. Uh, the universities have taken responsibility for the problem by introducing the concept of a national scholarly communications license. This is no different to the Harvard, or no, not significantly different, uh, to the Harvard license in the States, which has been introduced without destabilizing the market there, as far as I can see. Uh, unfortunately, some parts of the industry in the UK consider that it is destabilizing, uh, and at that point, I, the, the scholarly license is just a license to the university to load in a repository. It's a, a, in a, the US and as proposed in the UK, a collaboration with publishers where waivers are available that effectively respect embargoes, but it does tie together the employer and the employee for the first time, so there's the possibility of deploying economic levers. Uh, I always know where things are going wrong when people make assertions, will not back them up, and I know they're wrong. So the most obvious example here, which I have experienced in other aspects of my working life, is where uh, people from the industry told me the National Scholarly Communication Licence was incompatible with my open access policy. I thought, I wrote my open access policy. I can understand they may be wanting to read it as if it's incompatible, because they're in an argumentative position. But they didn't bother to ask me. And it clearly isn't, in my judgment, of what our policy is. Now, in any argument, once people start making assertions that you can shoot down, you know you haven't got a partnership. And the UK model was of partnership. So to me, there's a big concern that we've uh, already broken this partnership. Uh, the industry talked to me about the post-Finch consensus, which implied that we would not do unreasonable disruptions to give an opportunity uh, for a change to open access to happen in a way that made price not the main issue. Uh, 
I do not consider the NCSL is an unreasonable disruption. I think it's compatible with our previous processes. And I'm very concerned that the arguments around it have been in microcosm the arguments that we've had just, or the discussion actually, because there weren't arguments between Michel and Martin, people talking right past each other without engaging in the arguments. Something has gone wrong, and yet it's a modest disruption that has worked elsewhere in the world. My conclusion is the partnership model is indeed under threat. It's evidence to back up the Danny view of the world rather than the university's UK view of the world. Uh, now, uh, the other uh, uh, thing which should transform things is the Declaration on Research Assessment, DORA, uh, which is about the perception of value. And what that says is that universities in their promotion and appointments procedures will not use crude measures of uh, success, and particularly where an article was published as a measure of quality. The Dora says that basically you look at what has been published rather than where it has been published to assess the quality of the work. Uh, now that seems to me to be a fundamentally sensible position. Of course it's what you say that matters, not where it is published. On the other hand, I accept that those who are running professionally extremely well journals are consistently choosing in some cases, high quality pieces of work. So there is a correlation between quality and uh, location of publication, and it, my view is stupid to deny that. However, at the micro level that universities have to make decisions, and actually at the macro level at which we take decisions in our research assessment exercise, the research excellence framework, which is uh, my key responsibility, we do not use location, we do not use location of publication, and those universities that sign up to DORA uh, also do not use it. There is, however, some evidence, and I'm firing everyone now in this talk, there is some evidence that universities sign up to that declaration, but then do not apply it. So they say one thing, and they do another, which rather reinforces the academics in their view that perception of value might be connected with real value. Uh, for me, to move forward uh, in the UK context, continuing in a spirit of partnership, if this is the way we choose to go, we have to have the NCSL and we have to have universities, who are of course the key economic agents, taking responsibility for their actions by not only signing DORA, but by uh, implementing DORA. I think that changes the perception of value, uh, links together the uh, behaviour of academics and universities and introduces the possibility of market mechanisms being brought to bear. If things were to happen in that idealistic way, then I would expect the industry, which is full of the brightest uh, people I have ever met, to produce innovative solutions uh, that make sense in, uh, in terms of price related to cost and do away with the uh, clear alternative of developing at least as a developmental process publicly funded routes to publication which although in the medium term may be much better done in the private sector might be needed to uh, demonstrate that disruption is the only way uh, to bring some balance into the priced versus cost discussion. I have nothing more to say than this is our analysis and we look forward to taking a view on whether to continue with a partnership approach with the industry. Uh, as I have done, uh, did four years ago, I would urge the industry to eliminate the blot that is hybrid that is just uh, stopping, in my view, substantial further progress on gold open access in the UK. It is your problem, deal with it. I would urge universities to take responsibility for their uh, real value that they derive from the scholarly publishing uh, system, uh, and I would encourage academics to, uh, to do what they want to do, because as individuals, uh, we have to respect uh, what they want. The opportunity is there, uh, in my view, still for a partnership 
way forward with universities, but I think we need to be, see changes in the terms of debate that people use and also changes in terms of the offers that are available. I want to move forward in a partnership approach. I am much less positive than I was here four years ago and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much. Thank you, David, for this very interesting talk and the analysis of what has happened in the UK after the Finch report came out. Um, and I'm pretty sure that your talk and uh, the statement that you gave will provoke comments and questions. Please. Uh, ben Pulver from EMBO. Thank you, David, for your endorsement of the DORA principles. Um, one of the uh, critical issues is, of course, that assessment of actual content is very time intensive and there's a huge uh, overhead on the scientists themselves. So would you think that we could change the system of research assessment by actually rewarding the assessors or the, the referees in a more constructive way by the funders? Is that realistic? I'm not absolutely convinced that is necessary. I, l let me look at it from my own point of view, where, where we run a, a, a system every seven years where we look at 200,000 outputs, uh, over 1,000 people do it, and they take months off work to do it. Uh, I advertise, I'm doing it now, actually, adv advertising for people to take part. I have 1,000 places to fill. Last time I got 4,000 uh, people asking to take part, uh, and I, I can see why, because in my view, there's a considerable career advantage from having taken part at our end of the exercise. I think in, uh, that, that's a particular example, though. So, uh, we do it through peer review. We don't uh, probably read every word of every document, because uh, I think uh, we're just counting things into 4, 3, 2, 1. That is different from the refereeing process, either for grants or for publications. But let me come to your core point of should funders do it. Uh, I get a very large sum of money from the government and I give it all to universities. Uh, our research councils do it and they give it to, to projects and programs. The question is, should a funder divide that up into funding different elements of the system and therefore dictate how certain elements of the system work, which is effectively regulating through price. My position would be that you only do that in an immature market, where you're developing uh, new solutions, then indeed you fund the uh, initial costs. But in the long term, I think it is far better that decisions are taken uh, in discussion between uh, the economic actor, the university, and the industry, and that you don't try and pass off on to a third person uh, the responsibility for taking very detailed decisions. So in general, I think the answer is no to you, but I think as you try out new ways of doing things, occasionally it may make sense to start them off as you work towards a sustainable model, exactly what happened with the big deal. And a second very quick point, um, on the, I'm, I was surprised to hear that you think there's no way to put a real economic cost on publishing actually, on the publishing of a given research paper. Um, surely it must be possible to analyze this at least with academically run journals to get a real costing of publishing. Well, I, I think the first thing I'd say is I think I was talking about value, not cost. Uh, secondly, I think it sometimes certainly is possible, and I've seen many uh, details from learned societies that uh, uh, expose, first of all, exactly what their costs are, and secondly, where they are using costs uh, to subsidize other activity, typically fellowships and the like, which they consider is a reasonable part of their mission, uh, but which I think one is entitled to challenge. I think the problem with some of the big publishers is that uh, their, their costs are commercially in confidence and they won't share them. And, and sort of, I understand. Uh, I understand that. Uh, somebody said to me recently in relation to Michel's uh, 
profit margins, but of course, uh, they do lots of other things in Reed Elsevier as well, which of course you do phenomenally uh, successful company. Uh, but uh, in, on the occasions I've been involved, the company hasn't shown great interest in baking down its cost base, and why should it? Uh, we're not in the, in the business, uh, in my view, of crawling all over private companies and asking them to expose details. We are in the business of saying, though, so, uh, we find some things unacceptable and then expecting an answer from them. And, and Michael has given an uh, answer, so fair enough. Um, may I now just add a question from my side? Um, I, was, uh, I, fi I find it very curious that um, you reported that in the UK, since the Finch report came out and the open access policy was in place, um, the usage of hybrid journals was twice the worldwide average, whereas the non-APC journals was only about half of the worldwide average. Could you elaborate a little bit on this? What, what are the reasons for that? I, in some ways, I'd prefer to just report that as a fact, because uh, once you move into the reasons why you are bringing some uh, judgment in, I think the way Danny would see it, uh, to put this tactfully, is that those journals, uh, those publishers with so-called high-quality journals, which uh, people want to publish in, have chosen to increase their costs disproportionately because it's an opportunity uh, to make money. That would be her view of it. I think uh, they, it's for the journal publishers to make, say, their view, but I, I would present it as they would say that the, the costs of publishing in those journals are, are higher because of the scrutiny, the increased scrutiny they give, uh, they give work that's submitted to them and pro because they probably publish a, a lower proportion of the work that's submitted than some other journals. I'm not really interested in, in the detail of those two arguments because you've got to form a judgment. It's just an observation that we haven't got to where we wanted to get to, so something is not right. Time for one more question. Yeah, here in the back. Bob Campbell uh, uh, and the organizing committee for the program. Uh, David, uh, you seem to be suggesting that the Finch approach didn't work. Uh, I was on the Finch group, so uh, perhaps I feel some personal interest. But uh, so what are you suggesting, what vehicle would you suggest for the UK to negotiate uh, a new approach between Part for, for a partnership between publishers, H, higher in, education institutes, and so on. So is, are you, do you have a vehicle in mind that might work, given that perhaps Finch didn't work? Well, I, I think it's absolutely right to say that Finch hasn't worked as fast as we would have liked. I think that's, I, I, I'd be surprised if anyone dissented from that view. But I think I was presenting Danny's view that it hasn't worked alongside uh, Adam Tickell's UUK view that it is working and we just need to stick at it. And I'm absolutely forming no judgment about which of those views are right, especially since the statistics are basically the same from both groups. So no, Bob, I'm not saying it hasn't worked. I think I'm cert I am saying it hasn't worked yet. And I think we've got to take note of the fact that other countries are now doing things slightly differently. Uh, do we change tack to align with what some other countries have done? Would that be uh, helpful or are doing? Uh, and the Commission obviously uh, have, uh, have a role to play in this. Uh, whether we're in or out, we're still located where we are and we still work with you, uh, you all. So, uh, no, no, don't read anything into what I say. Uh, I'm just exposing to you some of the material that is readily available. I, I didn't notice everybody going yes when I presented Danny Kingsley's talk. I don't believe it's yet had much visibility. And the UUK uh, stuff, which is interesting, also hasn't had much visibility. And saying that in deciding where we go, uh, very specifically with funder policies, uh, we've got to take account of, uh, is it satisfactory that we're moving as fast as we are? Uh, should we change what we do? Uh, where is the partnership model working and not working? And I guess I was standing a steer that we need to get on with NCSL and DORA as part of the partnership rather than view it as a fracturing of the partnership. 
Thank you. I think we should now go on to the next speaker, and I thank you very much again.